I'm going to ask you at this time if you would stand. We're going to ask our ushers to come, and we're going to take up this morning's offering. And while they're coming, I'm going to share with you a thank you card from the Byers family. It says, Dear Park Avenue Baptist Church family, thank you for your support, words of encouragement, meals, and most importantly, your prayers during this time of loss. We are blessed to have you all as friends and family. Uh, with love, the Byers, Mike, Kara, Kobe, uh, Blaze, Jackson, and Bailey. Brother Ronnie, would you ask God's blessing over this, uh, this offering, please? Amen. You may be seated. This morning I want to talk to you about the gospel in its simplicity. Uh, it is in our nature, I don't understand it, I don't know why, but it's in our nature to make things complicated, isn't it? Uh, it's, it's, um, I mean, you see what we did with health care and you figure out real quickly we can make something that seems so necessary and yet so complicated. So I want to, I want to just give you the bare minimum. Now that does not mean necessarily that you have a small message. You may, I mean, I think you will, but it just at the same time, I want to share with you what is the, what is the bare necessity, what is, uh, if you could bring it down into just a few simple sentences, what is the gospel? And the gospel, uh, by its own definition, is good news, and this Bible contains that good news, and it's a pretty thick book, right? So it has a lot of good news, right? That's what we would understand it to be, but Paul said this, and we're going to look in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He said, he said this about this same church that we're going to look at. He said, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He said, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to come with you all, with all this theology. I didn't want to come with, to you with all, this, all the things that, uh, to say. I just wanted to say this one thing. That's all about Him and Him crucified. He says, I don't want to know anything else about that. And, and isn't it true that all our theology, everything is built on that, of Christ and Him crucified. And Paul here in 1 Corinthians 15, he just kind of brings it down to a very minimum. What is the gospel? What is the good news? And he says it there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look with me in verse 1. 
He says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, the good news, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Let's pray together. Father, we come before You. Lord, um, just to marvel at the simplicity that is the Gospel, of how that You came to this earth, how that You died for our sins, You were buried, You rose again. You offer eternal life to anyone who will believe and call upon Your name. But Lord, we all here have a sin problem. We have a, a sin problem that, that keeps us from You, uh, Lord, even whenever we are saved and we place faith in you, that sin kind of gets in the way and it can mess with our, our fellowship. Not our relationship, but Lord, our fellowship with you. And Lord, I pray for the ones here that, that Lord, that have never dealt with their sin, that they would put their faith and trust in you and uh, believe on you for the salvation of their, their souls. And Lord, for those of us who are saved, that Lord, that we would, uh, we would return to you uh, and, and forsake the sin that we... Uh, that we are committing and, and trust in you. God, be magnified here. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So, uh, so what is the gospel in its simplicity? It's, it's got three main, uh, three main parts to it. And I, ha uh, I don't have your notes out there with you this morning. I got that out too late. Uh, but it's, it's still, I mean, it's three S's, right? It's sin, it's a Savior, and it's salvation. A sin, the sin, the Savior, and our salvation. Now, we've got to look at the sin. And there's a problem today uh, in America and at the church at large is that we don't see sin for what it really is, for the disgusting thing it is. Because whenever a preacher gets up here and he says, you know, you've sinned, it seems like it's such an intangible thing, something like... Um, uh, I don't know, like a superstition that, that grown-ups made up so that you would uh, behave. You don't want to sin. It's a bad thing. But 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 tells you exactly what sin is. The sin is transgression of the law. That's when we break the law. Now, we didn't break man's law. Okay, We broke, in essence, God's law. And, and I think the reason that sin seems like it's such an intangible thing is because we don't, none of us has ever laid eyes on God. And no one here has ever seen God. And so it seems like we've broken a rule uh, to someone that we have never seen before. And so therefore it doesn't seem like it has any tangibility to it. It feels like it has no essence to it. But can I tell you this morning that sin is very tangible. Sin has very real consequences. And I want us to look at that here in a moment. But that's the problem with the church at large today, is that we don't see the big deal about sin. We, we compromise with it. We, we flirt with it. We, we have this, this very strange relationship with it. It's, I'm not talking about lost people. I'm talking about us as a church, as Christians. We laugh at it. Oh, it's so funny on television. You see what I'm getting at? We, have, we don't see it for the disgusting nature that it really is. We don't see it for the danger that it is, uh, that, it, that it's venomous, that, it's, that it has a poison to it, that it will kill you. And so when, I, when we talk about the first element of sin, sin in its anatomy has three main parts to it. And that, those three main parts are very well put out in James chapter 1, verse 15, or verse 14 and 15. He says this, But every man is tempted... When he is drawn away of his own lust, that is his own desires, and then he's enticed. And when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, it brings forth death. Now, so sin has three parts. We're going to look at the first part of that of lust or desire. Uh, when lust has conceived, that is desire, it has, uh, when it, it will bring forth sin. Now, lust... I want you to understand, lust is simply a desire that has been distorted. A lot of times, many times, sin that we, that we so uh, catch ourselves caught up in 
It's, it's to fulfill a legitimate desire in an illegitimate way. Uh, let me give you a case in point, okay? Uh, some of you here in the next 20 to 30 minutes will start feeling hunger pains, okay? And you'll be wanting the pastor to speed his sermon up. I get that, all right? Now, hunger is a legitimate desire, right? Eating is a very good thing to do, right? Or, you won't di or you'll die if you don't, right? So it's a good thing. It's a self-preserving -pre kind of thing. The problem with it is, is whenever we distort it, and we eat too much, which is called gluttony. Or we don't, or we're, uh, we, we vomit it up. That's bulimia, right? You see what happens? We distort it. We take a desire and we distort it. We, we pervert it. And that's what sin is. God has given you some great desires. Desires for food, right? Desires for uh, social acceptance and different things like that. Those are legitimate desires. But when we go about uh, getting these desires in illegitimate ways, that is the desire that is lust. And when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. Now, uh, I have it here somewhere. There it is. There is a... Uh, let me tell you how this distortion also works. Curiosity is a good thing, right? It's good to be curious. It's good to, because from that we learn things, right? But what if I told you before I came in here that I painted the back of these pews and it's got wet paint in front of it? You had no desire whatsoever to touch the front of this pew. But now that I've told you it's wet and you shouldn't touch it, what is that curiosity wanting to do? Touch the paint. What is that? That is lust. That is a desire that has been corrupted. Now, so when lust is finished, it brings forth sin. Now, sin is the actual act of having touched the paint, having ate too much food, having, you know, uh, given in to a desire that is not, uh, that is not uh, legitimate. And what is sin? Sin is simply bait that's got hooks. I bother, borrowed my father-in-law's uh, tackle. Satan's bait all have hooks. And so when lust... Now, now I want you to notice that if you go fishing, you don't just throw a hook in there, do you? No, right? No, every, every, everybody knows that you don't eat a hook. But what do you do? You doctor it up, you paint it up, you make it look like a, something that's desirable, and then the fish takes it. Satan does the same thing. He takes the desire that you already have for food, for social acceptance, curiosity, all these wonderful desires, God-given desires, and he says, but you can have them right now. And what happens when this fish takes his hook? It becomes its prisoner. And that's what I want you to see. We don't see sin as having a tangible thing, right? Right? But let me tell you, it has a very tangible hold on many people. Think about alcohol, for example. It has a very tangible hold. But I, what's so great about it, what's so funny about it, is that people say, oh, I can quit whenever I want. There's a problem, though. I don't want to quit. All right, same thing goes with any sin. You take sexual immorality. There is a thrill. There is something there that they enjoy, and they don't want to stop it. Oh, I can quit whenever I want. You just don't want to quit. That's where sin has taken you, and you are now hooked. And you are now get, being pulled in a direction you wouldn't have been pulled before. Do you see how that sin has its consequence in, uh, in having constrained you, trapped you? You are now a servant to sin. Do you not see the shackles that have been laid upon you? Do you not see the sin that has so gripped you? So when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. It brings forth the act of, of defying God's law. And, it, and when we commit the crime, we commit the sin. When we give in and we commit the sin, we, many times we awaken an appetite. Get this. We awaken an appetite that wasn't there before. All right, let me give you a case in point. I've never drunk a drop of alcohol in my life. Do you know why? 
because I know what it can do to people. I've seen it destroy too many people. And, and you know what? I have no appetite for that. But give me a drink. And there will awaken in me, no doubt, an appetite that was not there before. And that's what sin does, is that it awakens sometimes an appetite. It felt good. And, and now you're hooked, you're enslaved to its desire. And that's what Paul was talking about in Romans 6, verse 16. He says, Know you not that to whom you yield your, yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. And so just like whoever, whatever you give yourselves over to, that's what you're going to be enslaved to. Whether sin, which will lead you to your death, or righteousness, or obedience that will lead you unto righteousness. Now, the last thing that sin brings about is death. So you have the lust that brings about the, the desire for the sin, you commit the sin, and now that you're in bondage to that sin, Sin now owns you to your very grave. Sin requires a corpse. Sin will not relinquish its hold on you. It is a life sentence. It is the final result that ends in death. Sin, it will require your corpse. It is the only way you and I escape uh, escapes, uh, sin is by death. And that's no real escape at all, is it? And the wages of sin is death. The outcome of us of having sold ourselves, that's exactly what we do. When we become a servant to sin, we become a slave to it. It's because we sold ourselves to it. And now it requires our very lives. And when it is finished with us, it wads us up and it throws us in our own graves. But this is only the stage for the good news. It's like, this is the gospel, right? There's supposed to be some good news in here somewhere, right? Where's the good news? And that's why we have a Savior. That is why we have a Savior. And He delivers us, get this, from the consequence of sin. Then what was the consequence? The wages of sin was death. And Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. He went to a cross that was your cross, and He died in your place. And He took the consequence of your sin. He took the wrath of God that was intended for you, and He took it upon Himself. He died in your place. So that you would not have just the consequence of sin. And many times the gospel just stops right there. And that is not it. That is not the end of it. Because think about it. I'm still enslaved to the very sin in the present and now. Who cares if he, if he delivers me from... I mean, I do care about it. Don't get me wrong. If he delivers me from then, when I die. But what about right now? Why do I have to be slave and hold to the sin now? And that's why I think the gospel has, has not reached what it should in many people's lives is because we just think about eternal life being about the there and then and not about the here and now. Eternal life doesn't begin when you die. It begins when the moment you first believe. You are liberated and set free. So he delivers us, yes, from the consequence of sin, but he does so much more than that. He also delivers us from sin's hold on us. That is, he takes the hook out. He takes the hook out. What is so significant about that? Well, beforehand, your days and your time was consumed with, you know, you know if, you were, if you were just given to alcohol, about when's your next drink? If you're given to sexual immorality, when's the next thrill? When you're given to drugs, when's the next high? You're just thinking about the next time. Do you not see that, you, remember, you're a slave to that. So once he sets you free from that, what is, the, what is the result of that? You are now free to do what you were intended to do. Instead of thinking about the next thing, the next sin, you now are free to honor your Father, which is in heaven. He sets you free from its hold. How does he do that? Oh, this is good. Because when we put our faith and trust in him, yes, we're saved from the consequence of sin. But how does he relinquish the hold? He takes that heart, that heart of stone that's been in every one of us, that longs, it says that our, the flesh, it lusts, it desires, it envies to sin. That's what it wants to do. And he takes that desire out. He puts a new heart in. And he doesn't just put a new heart in. Get this, the Holy Spirit comes and he lives within me and you. 
those that believe. And He causes us to walk in His ways. To do the things that He desires. To set us free. Because I, let me say this, child of God. You can be a child of God and still be a, a victim and still be in prison to your own lust and desires and sin. And it's only whenever we walk in the Spirit that we're delivered from the flesh. There's there no, therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. So we have been delivered from its consequence. You today have been liberated from the sin that you are being holding on to right now. There's not a sin that you are going through right now that you cannot be liberated from. Why? Because He has conquered sin by dying on the cross. He's conquered death by, raising, by rising from the grave. And now He offers you eternal life, not just then, but right in the here and now to deliver you from the sin that you are holding to. He delivers us from these sins that we get caught up in. He frees us so that we might serve Him of our own free will. And many, many think that because the end of sin has been dealt with, the consequence of sin has been dealt with. Well, now that the consequences are done, I can just go and sin and do whatever I want. Right? Church, Romans 6. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid it. How can we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? Let me give you an example to that. I graduated from Arkansas State University in 2006. You know, they're still having tests over there. They're still having exams. They're still having homework. They're still, they're still having classes over there. But I've graduated from that. I've graduated. I don't have to take the tests anymore. So someone who goes, this is exactly what happens to a child of God. You have graduated. You have been lifted up out of that. Why would you go back and go to the classes that you've graduated from? Why would you go back to the sin that you've just been liberated from? That makes no sense at all. Exactly. So you've been liberated from the hold on sin. Now I want you to see the next thing that we've been delivered from. We've been delivered from that sin's desire. And how does that happen? Again, he puts that new nature within us. He comes and he dwells within me and you, and we are, uh, he, he lives in us so that we can uh, will and do His desire. And the last thing I want you to see, this is the exciting thing, is that He delivers us from sin's presence. Uh, nobody here, once you put faith in Christ, stops sinning, okay? I sin on a regular basis. I, I repent of that. I always, I still have the problems, and you probably, if you live long enough, you know, sin is still ever with me. That's what Paul said. It's still with me. Okay, and I still struggle with it. But one day, this is the exciting thing, one day he's going to deliver me from its very presence. How's he going to do that? Well, when Jesus died, he rose again from the grave. He ascended on high, and he says, I'm coming back again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Because get this, don't lose sight of this. He's going to descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ are going to rise up. And we which are alive and remain are going to be caught up together with them in the clouds. And there shall we ever be with the Lord. He's going to deliver us from the very presence of sin. You will never even have to think about it anymore. You not, if, if today you are dealing and are captured by sin, you need to understand there's deliverance from every angle, every part of it. And if you are holding to sin today, it's because you have rendered yourself to it. And you have knelt at it, and you say, I am your servant. The way that you overcome it is that you... It's, it's funny, the very reason that we, we get into sin is the, is the very same way that we get out. We, we, uh, we give in to its desire, right? You know how do we get out of it? We give in to Christ's desire. To God's desire. And I like what one preacher said. You went from waving the white flag going this way to waving the white flag going that way. And surrendering to Christ instead of surrendering to your desires and sin. So he delivers, from us, uh, he delivers us from the very presence of sin. Now, I said, Brother Heath, that's really good to know. That's good to know about the sin, its anatomy, how it's composed of lust, of sin, and then of death. 
It's good to know that Christ, in His death, He, he, uh, he overcomes our consequences. He overcomes our, the hole, the prison that we're in. He overcomes the desires of it. And He overcomes uh, the presence of it. But how do I... What is required of me? What then should I do? Acts 16, verse 30, asked that question. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What is the requirement of the individual to be saved? Believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. That's all that's required. You say, well, that sounds so easy. Well, hang on. Remember what I said earlier about those that are caught up in sin many times don't want to be delivered from it. Why? Because they're holding to it. Uh, they're, it's captive, and they don't realize they're being captured by it, okay? They still think they can quit whenever they want, right? That they're in control, that they have it under their thumb, but the problem with that is, is that is a deception. Now, why is it then that, you know, why is it then that with the, the call to salvation, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Why is it so easy? But why do people not do it? I'll tell you why. It's because they still want their sin. In John 3.16, right? You know that, that verse. But John 3.17 and 18 is the reason why people don't come to the light. Why is that? Because their deeds are evil. And they prefer the darkness. And I don't know why people sometimes don't come. Because, because the sin that they're holding on to, yes, that's part of it. Maybe it's the shame of it. Maybe it's the shame of a sin that they've done in their past. And they don't come to Christ because of that. But whatever the reason, can I say to you, there is an invitation that he's already taken it all on him. The punishment, everything has been taken on him. And if you want to be freed from sin today, he is giving you that ability to call on his name. That's what an invitation is all about. That's why we, we say, if you will put your faith and trust in him, if you want to be delivered from sin, that has been made available to you today. But what is the problem? Again, a lot of people don't want to. They want to live a promiscuous life. They want to live a life that, that is pleasing to them and their flesh. But for those of you who know now, it's been revealed to you, the prison that you're in with sin, it is now, the door has been opened wide, and if you stay there, it's only because you close the door back on yourself. Because He has made it available to you if you'll put your faith and trust in Him. I'm going to ask our musicians to come, and we're going to have a moment of invitation. You say, Brother Heath, that was very short. Well, the gospel itself is simple. It's so simple, anyone can do it. The problem is, is not everybody wants to do it. That's the problem that we face. And can I say this to you, child of God? If you're here and you're still captive by sin, you need to come to the altar and, and ask God to help you get out of that, help you to break the chains of that. That's what an altar here is for, is that you might find deliverance here. And if you're lost this morning, you've never placed faith in Christ, that is the purpose of you coming forward, so that you might proclaim liberty. I have been set free from the bondage of sin. I have placed faith in Christ. And that's why we baptize, right? It's so that I say, I believe in His death, His burial, and His resurrection. And He will one day... He's going to deliver us from the very presence of sin itself. And that's what we worship Him for. And that's what we look forward to onto that day. But where are you this morning? Where are you? Do you? What's your relationship with sin like right now? You think, oh, I've got it all under control. You've got it all under control. And I, I, I don't have to worry about that, Brother Heath. I can leave it whenever I want it. Well, then just why don't you just leave it right now this morning? and come to Christ and place your faith and trust in Him. There's no sin that you love so dear that's worth dying and going to hell for. He has met, he's paid the consequence. He is giving you liberty this morning if you'll put your faith and trust in Him.